Uh, welcome back to the second half of Brighter Morning with Bo. I am Bo Tiwari. And we have two guests from the business community who will come on in this second half. They are Mr. Vivek, Vivek sorry, Ch Charan, who is the uh, president of the Confederation of uh, regional Chambers of Commerce, and Mr. Rambasad Siraj, who is, the, um, who is a member of the executive. Vivek uh, is owner of a, a book uh, a store and related matters business, and Rambasad Siraj is a member of the um, a member of the Siparia um, Regional uh, Chamber, and he is an accountant by profession and has his own uh, small company. So we will talk with them shortly. Um, we were talking before about the literacy issues and the um, educational issues, the reading issues. And there were so many questions I wanted to ask Dr. Skerritt, uh, for instance, you know, why is it that sometimes a child is reading, let's say, up to the age of eight, read age eight or nine, and then suddenly the child kind of loses interest in reading? Um, I, and I think part of that has to do with the nature of the SEA exam uh, and the fact that that drilling of the exam um, and the demands of the exam really, really dissuades the child, the student, from, uh, you know, these kinds of creative endeavors, and I, I, I think it's very disruptive of the reading pattern. Uh, the second thing is, how come a child would be good at reading and love to read and read all kinds of things, but when it comes to the study of literature, um, they would not read the literature texts? Uh, and they have an aversion to reading the literature text. And uh, they have a, an aversion also for doing the subjects that require reading for meaning, whether it is geography or history and so on. And uh, I mean, all the things that you do require some reading. If you're doing chemistry, you're required to read and understand if you're doing physics, it's the same thing. If you're doing mathematics, in order to outline a problem, you have to understand the meaning of what is said in the statement of the problem. And then they ask you to do something about the problem. And also, I, 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 I was interested in that. And then there's another matter that concerns me is that you know, we emphasize reading at an early age so that if you're um, if your child can read at the age of three, that is regarded as a real achievement. You know, sometimes there are children reading at the age of two, two and a half. Uh, that is regarded as a real achievement. If you get your child to read well by the age of five, you think the child is doing good, etc. But you know, there are some societies. Uh, very, very enlightened societies and societies in which you have large numbers of highly educated people. For instance, Germany, in which, you know, they teach the child all kinds of things uh, once a child gets into preschool and school, except reading. And they do not, uh, they do not basically bother with reading until the child is seven or eight and then, um, and then uh, we, based on what I know of these systems, the child does not um, 
have any problems either learning to read or being able to comprehend what he or she reads after that. So I don't know if it's based on the basis that you give the child as much experience, exposure in learning things, doing things, collaborating, talking with people, etc. When you come to read, you then see how the words make meaning because you have a significant amount of experience and exposure gathered already that has nothing to do with reading a text. So all of these things, I mean, this is not my field of study, but I mean, it is something that interests me and something of value and education to me uh, is always the most important thing in the world. I am dismayed at the discussion about education in this country and, uh, um, it, and the irrelevancy of a lot of the discussion and the stupidity of a lot of the discussion, quite frankly. Um, because, I mean, I, I don't see how a society is able to develop without uh, educated people, without skilled people, without people who are willing to learn and who are willing to teach in a collaborative setting. And I don't see how you can develop a society in today's world without a knowledge sector. And that, by that I don't mean schooling, you need all of that. But you need to have a research sector in your society or else you are dead. The research sector has to do a, three or four things. They have to research your own society so you know how your society is living and operating. And it is important to do that. They have to research specific domains of knowledge uh, so that you can uh, see what it is possible to create out of your surroundings as you apply those domains of knowledge. Uh, you have to look at what the rest of the world is doing and see where the world is headed and you've got to transfer that in your own location in terms of the design of research that you, de you develop. And finally, you've got to capitalize on the world's knowledge wherever people are doing work and research and you know about it, you've got to bring that knowledge home so it becomes part of your knowledge pool in the society in which you live. And I think the whole knowledge discussion uh, in Trinidad and Tobago is very warped. This is a very anti-intellectual society. Even the people in academia are anti-intellectual. Um, and don't talk about politicians. They don't, they're not interested in any ideas except their own. And they could have a stupid idea and carry it politically for years, uh, ignoring all the facts and all the information around them. And if you have a discourse that is conditioned by this kind of thinking, you have a serious problem in your society. So this issue of reading and literacy and getting meaning, and uh, Dr. Scarrett raised the issue of being able to think, to think, to discern, to assess critically. All of these things we didn't go into, but it's a very important domain for Trinidad and Tobago. I think we have our two guests on the line now. We want to bring them on. So what we will do now is that we will take a commercial break and we will be right back. This is Brighter Morning with Bo. I am Bo Tiwari, and when we come back, we talk to Vivek Charan and Rampasad Siraj of the Confederation of Regional Chambers of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to Lifetime Solutions, where you can trust your roof to us. Our services include custom fabrication, steel framing, roofing installation, on-site roll forming, roofing maintenance and services. Call 223-ROOF or 223-7663 for a quote today or visit our website. 
www.lifetimesolutionstt.com Lifetime Solutions, you can trust your roof to us. Call 223-ROOF or 223-7663 for a quote today or visit our website www.lifetimesolutionstt.com Feel the joy and love this time of year with MCTV and U975FM by donating non-perishable items, personal care for all ages and gender, baby items and toys clearly labeled with age and gender. Drop-off zones are located at RCN Office, Guayamere Link Road, Charlieville, five buildings after holiday foods, northbound. Super Quality Supermarket, three locations, Macoya, Chiguanas and Coover. drop off have already begun and continue all the way to the 20th of December 2021. Make a difference this Christmas with MCTV and U975 FM. Sport Insight, where we bring sport to life. Be viewing every Monday and Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. right here on MCTV. Welcome back. This is Brighter Morning with Bo, and I am Bo Tiwari. Our guests this morning are Mr. Vivek Charan and Mr. Rampasad Siraj of the Confederation of Regional Chambers. And we are talking to you on MCTV, Multicultural TV, on many channels in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region. So let us welcome our guests. Uh, Mr. Siraj, how are you? Uh, Mr. Charan, how are you? How are you doing? Good morning. Thank you very much for um, having us on. Yeah, we're glad to have you because we want to know what's happening in business. How are you faring? Mr. Siraj, how are you? How are you doing? Are you hearing me? Fine, fine thank you. Good morning. Good morning to yourself and good morning let's, to your listeners and viewers. Right. Let's get, we need to get your volume up, Mr. Siraj. So check with your phone there and we'll try to adjust it on this side as well. Um, this morning, I want, to, I want to start with a simple question. Did have any of the businesses that you are aware of, including your own, uh, have any of the businesses that you are aware of, including your own, I repeat, been helped in any way by the government through any of its uh, announced strategies uh, for coping with the COVID pandemic? I don't want to. Well, obviously, first I'd like to say that it's broader than that because if you want to say, has any of the businesses that we know of, including our own, been helped by some of the, um, the, the, the funds or the grants or um, financially, financial assistance through the government? Um, the answer to that is no. I am not aware of, nobody has reached out to me to say I have access or reached out to us to say we have access to these particular grants. and. Um, it has assisted us and um, it has helped us. The question about the management of COVID is a bit, is again also broader simply because by allowing the economy to reopen and by allowing certain sectors, particularly retail, um, let's say enter certain sectors of entertainment to come back and reopen after the lockdown, that has significantly helped business, obviously, simply because um, being under lockdown or being under tight restrictions and not being able to operate or earn income, uh, you know, was was detrimental to the the, the business itself and, and the business going forward and so on. So, with regard to that aspect of um, of of, of um, COVID management, um, the lockdowns having ended, um, the confidence being shown right now in that there is no imminent lockdown. Um, in the near future, as um, oh, that is the message that the business community is taking from 
the Prime Minister's uh, most recent address to the nation. Um, then there's also the situation of uh, the safe zones, having created the safe zones. Uh, that has allowed uh, certain sectors, particularly bars and, and restaurants that have been struggling for a very long time uh, with the lockdowns and so on, even cinemas, to be able to um, come back out and, and operate on a level of uh, profitability. Whether that is slim profitability or not, it allows them to bring out their workers, it allows them to earn some income and re-engage in, in commerce and, and in, the, in the economy. So from that perspective, um, yes, um, you know, it has helped. Uh, however, it, it is, I think what is happening now, it is beyond, uh, it's, it's, we're at a very challenging point and, and I, I'm wondering whether it is even beyond, um, you know, what, what can we do to move forward? And when we look at the, 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 the situation that we're in now and the environment we're in now, we're looking at what people are saying is the third wave and so on. And, um, we're looking at hospital numbers, number of infections, and numbers of, number of deaths. And globally, when we look at it, and I was doing some research, and we looked at what's happening in France, and what's happening in Austria, and what's happening in other places, because daily I am, and we are all confronted with all this information that's coming our way on social media, uh, locally through people on Facebook, uh, people who say they're influencers, um, people who are forwarding things on WhatsApp that is said to be actual news and so on. So one of the things that I read very recently was that in the third wave, how many countries are locking down again and so on for a month and, and, and that sort of thing. The reality is that no country, if you want to control um, the rate of infection, can lock down for only a month. I think I read an article in one of the UK newspapers from a virologist that said it takes a minimum of eight weeks because it's a cycle before, if you lock down, before you can even see, uh, you know, numbers beginning to fall. And what globally some large countries are, uh, are, are handling the situation is that they're saying in lieu of a lockdown, in lieu of other measures, um, we are pushing forward the booster shots um, for, for individuals and we are managing the population of um, you know, people who are unvaccinated and so on. In Trinidad, um, the, the population of unvaccinated and the number of deaths that we're seeing uh, and the rate of hospitalizations are all, you know, tied together from the data that is presented to us every so often from the Ministry of Health at one of the briefings. It is said that it is the unvaccinated, by and large, over 90% that are ending up in the worst situations in the hospital and you know, um, are succumbing to the virus um, death. However, there is a larger, there's a lot of phobia out there about the, the vaccine. And I, and I don't know through the tremendous efforts of, um, I think the government and public and private partnerships and even private individuals and companies and so on, to raise awareness and to get people to understand, you know, the choices that they have, um, which is take the vaccine, protect your life, so on. Um, According to the science, there's a lot of pushback and there's this phobia that uh, something will happen to me. And, and on a daily basis, we're seeing that. And uh, as, the, as the situation is changing and we're hearing chambers and we're hearing, um, you know, we're seeing articles in the newspapers and so on, concerned about where we are nationally, asking the government to consider mandatory vaccination. We're also seeing on the flip side of that, uh, on social media, um, an, an immediate ramp up against that by people saying, well, I know this one who's taking the vaccine and they, um, they can't feel anything on their right side or they can't move their leg. Or, so again, there's that sowing, sowing the fear of what is going to happen. And my, you know, I would like to submit that um, it doesn't matter whether we get the, the virus or not. And, and unfortunately, or, or perhaps in the future, um, we will all end up getting the virus at some point or the other. It is not a problem to get the virus if we don't end up in hospital. If all we have is a fever and feel poorly for a couple of days, and then we get over it, um, we don't end up in hospital and obviously nobody wants to die. If we get the virus and the worst does not happen to us, it's like any other virus or swine flu that we've passed through in Trinidad and Tobago, then that is okay. The problem is the hospitalization. And the problem is, most of all, how do we reduce the deaths? 
And I don't think that there's any way out there right now, according to the information that is available, um, to reduce the number of deaths, particularly with people with comorbidities. And, you know, people, and, the, and, the co and you know, comorbidities is a very wide, wide term. It, it encompasses a lot of things, other than to take the vaccine. And so here we are um, still, you know, on, on one half, we have people in the country saying, submitting to the government and pleading with the government, can we please mandate um, the vaccines? And then we have the other people who are saying, uh, no, you can't do that, and that infringes upon our rights, and it is wrong, and we don't trust the vaccine, and we think the vaccine is more harmful than good. But in the meantime, many people are dying. And unless we solve the problem in the hospitals, unless we solve the problem and we bring down the death rate in a real way, because a lockdown is not going to bring down the death rate, it's just going to delay the inevitable if, you know, we have a, that large population of unvaccinated again then that is what is going to continue to keep us where we are in this particular situation in the economy, where many people are still out of jobs, where many people are still unemployed, where many people are still stuck at home, where children, I was listening to your, um, your, what you were saying earlier about literacy rates and things, and that's an entire conversation all by itself and that you can have about business and employment and whatever, but all of that will continue to happen. And all that will have its own slow, but you know, slow er er erosion, if like effect, on the economy and so on, going into 2022, un unless we solve that critical situation. And the good thing about safe zones is that the safe zones, the people who are in safe zones, have accepted the fact and have chosen to say, well, okay, you know what? This is a win-win situation for us because it allows us to operate. And we, it allows us to employ more people. And it allows a sector that was previously closed for you know, a very long time to reopen. So perhaps the government could consider widening the scope of the safe zones um, in addition to the other measures they're taking. I also see that they have also opened up the idea of the third jab, uh, which is the, the booster. And I think just as France has and many of the other larger countries, um, you know, the, 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 the booster shot, which I think has been well subscribed to, um, from what I understand, um, is, the way, is also a, a good thing to go forward. But fundamentally and critically, uh, unless we reduce that death rate, unless we reduce the rate of hospitalization, um, you know, the economy will continue to feel, um, you know, the effects and, and it is, will be difficult for us, no matter how much we debate um, you know, what we should do and how we need to get out of this and we need to diversify and we need, what about oil and gas and all, it is difficult for us to move forward in any sense if we are still under restrictions and we are still, um, you know, where all the sectors are still not able to come out, um, particularly things like, you know, tourism and, and, and so on, into that new year 2022. Okay, um, Mr. Mr. Siraj, uh, you want to add your perspective to this? Let me hear, let me hear what you have to say, though. Add to what Vivek have said, except that I believe that the population has been, has available a wealth of information pertaining to the vaccine, uh, the positivity. Hello. There is an, an, an avalanche of information out there as to why the vaccine should be taken. I am personally of the opinion that the government need to make a hard decision and have mandatory vaccine. In the absence of not wanting to go politically um, and have the mandatory vaccine, well then after implement some rules and regulation whereby People who choose not to be vaccinated, they have a right, and I respect the right not to be vaccinated, but that right doesn't give them a right to, to be in an environment where I have gone through all the pains of having the vaccine, and I am, I am likely to con contract this COVID from those who are not vaccinated, as the data have shown. Um, frankly, the government need to bite the, the bullet and, and make decisions that is in the interest of the population. Uh, 
drive-in, for example, um, without a seatbelt, it is your right as well. But they have made a law, and it is beneficial. The greater good of, of the people uh, is, is far more beneficial than, than those of the, the, the minority that choose not to want to. Uh, uh, it's your right, but that gives you a right to, to contaminate the rest of society, um, and the government need to make that hard decision and ensure that, that, that there is some sort of mandatory vaccine. In the absence of that, again, uh, um, probably put measures in place where those who are ill will probably pay their own medical Those who have chosen not to be vaccinated and end up um, with COVID probably stay at home and look after themselves because they are occupying the ICU beds for those who have chosen to do what is right. The, the long and short is decisions have to be made and, 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 and policy makers, decision makers, they are elected to make decisions and they need to make the, the decisions in the better interest of the country. Um, what about, I, I, I want to explore this safe zone concept. The safe zone concept is meant to create the environment I, in which those who are vaccinated have access to goods and services and those who are not vaccinated are not allowed entry into those safe zones. Vivek, you mentioned the issue of... Um, Vivek, could you take up the question? I have I have a connectivity problem here, so I didn't quite hear. Yeah, the... the, the um, no, I'm asking the question, Vivek, you, you mentioned the issue of expanding uh, the safe zone concept. Um, do you feel we should get to the point where we basically say, um, in order to enter a public space in which other people are there, you have to show your vaccination card? Um, do you feel that we should do that as a way of ensuring that the unvaccinated do not come into spaces in which the vaccinated have access? Do you think we should go that far and basically create an economic domain for the vaccinated? I, I don't think that, you see, we have to understand what is meant, what what is the safe zones addressing? So I listened to Mr. Siraj and you know, you, you, you get the sense of frustration and fear and there's frustration and fear on both sides. Fear that we're gonna go back into a lockdown, what that means for my community, what that means for business. Um, the idea of who, who can get the virus from whoever, whether vaccine, vaccinated gives it to unvaccinated, unvaccinated gives it, that's a moot point now. It doesn't matter who you get the, 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 the virus from. What happens is after you get the virus, what is going to happen? Are you going to end up in hospital and are you going to die? And according to the statistics, it says that, and that's all I have to go on, all we all have to go on. It says that within the hospital system, the majority of people who end up in the hospital system get worse and die would be people who are unvaccinated and with comorbidities and so on. Now, the question with safe zones is that the safe zone was not built to discriminate. The safe zone was not built to discriminate between vaccinated and unvaccinated. The key concept here is how do we manage congregation? Because congregation is key because congregation is important in an economy. Congregation is how commerce happens. Congregation within particular sectors, the entertainment industry, events industry, um, tourism industry, uh, even retail. Congregation is how commerce happens. How do we manage congregation when we're, when we're dealing with a virus here that is, you know, um, virulent and in a sense it can pass from one person to the other quickly? The safe zone idea says that we can allow managed congregation because within managed congregation, we mitigate the risks of congregation. Because if we put people who have been vaccinated together, you know, if we allow them to congregate, then that means that on the statistics or based on what we know so far, there's a less likelihood of those people, if there is a transmission of the virus between them, ending up in hospital 
or dying. So the, the question is that, no, no, the, the, what I'm saying is that the safe zone or ideas like the safe zone is not meant to discriminate and say, as an unvaccinated person, you shall not have the right. It is a way to manage congregation. And it is a way as well to, to manage the risks associated with the transmission of the disease. So, for example, if you were to say, let us just reopen. Let us not have any safe zone. Let everybody go into it. Then what you can have is you'll have, a, and you know what, we're having trans, we're having an increase in, in daily infections and so on. And, and it is to be expected. And globally, if you look all over the world, people are traveling to Miami, people are traveling to New York. I've recently realized that during the Christmas period, there's going to be almost a, a, a mini mass migration out of Trinidad as people decide to spend the holidays abroad with family and so on, or just take a vacation. And the reality is that when you step out of Trinidad and Tobago, there's a culture shock, particularly in North America, where you see people not wearing masks and everything appears to be open. They have taken a decision, you know, within particular states to say, uh, we are not managing congregation. Congregate as you will, but you ha they have perhaps the healthcare systems that is expansive enough to deal with what is going to come out of that. It doesn't mean that their daily infection rate is falling. It doesn't mean that they're not having deaths. What they're saying is that our healthcare system can handle it, and so we're not looking to manage congregation in any way. We in Trinidad and Tobago, we are saying that we're erring on the side of caution, and we're saying we need to manage the congregation. And we need to mitigate the risks of people meeting together. And what happens to those people when they meet together, particularly those people who don't have uh, the vaccine, who have not yet been exposed or, or, or you know, made their own antibodies and so on, and who have comorbidities. And that way we manage what is happening in our health, you know, how, how we do it within our hospitals, because we don't have that expansive you know, uh, healthcare system to cater to what is happening. At the end of the day, we are still 600,000 people into over 600,000 people into the, um, you know, into or quest for some sort of immunity or herd immunity. And now we are into the booster system, which is good. And that's good for those people who have decided to take it to protect themselves and so on. But we still have a large population of people who are saying we don't want it. And we have, phob we have a phobia against this thing. We are afraid. We don't trust it, whatever. So how do we then manage that? Um, and how do we then deal with the idea of congregation when it comes to you know, mixing people with different levels of risk together within the society and within the economy? It is going to happen anyway. It is going to happen in your house. It is going to happen when people get together. It is going to happen you know, in, in public transport. It's happening anyway. People are, the unvaccinated are mixing with the vaccinated. It is going to happen. What we're saying is that in, closed, in, in a closed environment, in an environment of commerce, in certain environments and so on, the best that we can do to mitigate the risk of, you know, um, when, when, if, there's any, if there's any indication that there is, you know, people are, have, have been infected and so on, to mitigate the risk of people ending up in the hospital and dying, then we create the safe zones. Because even within the safe zones, if people who have the vaccine, you know, theoretically get the virus and so on, they run a much less chance of ending up in the hospital and, and, and dying than someone who does not. Yeah. Yeah, so the premise of, of the safe zone is not prejudice. The premise of the safe zone is management of congregation yeah, but and I, a mitigation I, I, of the risks. I hear your argument, but I'm not convinced, Vivek. I, I mean... Where, um, why is it discrimination uh, to say that in order to enter a public place, as they did in France for the trains, as you do now with airlines, uh, etc., you have to show proof of vaccination? Why is that discrimination in a situation in which there is a definite health risk? posed by unvaccinated people uh, with vaccinated and the mixing. I always thought it was a stupid idea to have teachers who were vaccinated and unvaccinated go to school to teach. I really cannot see the rationality of that. 
And the second thing, I thought it was wrong to put vaccinated students with unvaccinated students in the classroom. I think it's as an unnecessary risk. And I am yet to be convinced that it is any form of discrimination whatsoever to tell someone, if you don't have a vaccination card, you cannot come into this public domain. I, I do not, I, I, I don't see what is the, wh where the discrimination is. And this distinction between managing congregation and managing uh, risk um, and uh, basically making the, the vaccination card you know, mandata mandatory for public engagement uh, in a um, situation in which you have a uh, different, a large number, fairly reasonable, uh, la reasonably large numbers of people. I, I, I don't buy it. Let me hear what Mr. Siraj has to say. I don't know what, I don't know what his perspective is on this. Because I think the whole thing depends on this. Dr. Tiwari? You, you can't, you can't, the economy is not going to open up, all right, unless we can bring, the, fully, unless we can bring the number of unvaccinated people down. Tourism is not, is going to be a non-starter if your unvaccinated rate and the level of infections and the level of deaths continues. Uh, we are seeing a situation now where the world is going into isolation. Everybody's stopping everybody from traveling everywhere. And basically, you're going to have isolated countries connected by technology, virtual, digital. So we're going, all going to be connected digitally and virtually, but the countries are going to be isolated because you don't have planes flying to bring people into the country. Japan has taken the extreme position that with yeah. Omicron, they are not even allowing their citizens to come back to the country. Right. That they are, are basically keeping those people who are in Japan together and locking out the rest of the world for the time being. So maybe all of those things are wrong because we are trying to find a solution here. But this is an unprecedented situation. And we've got to find a collective way of doing it. And let me tell you something. In this collective way of making a decision and making a solution, everybody cannot get everything what, that they want. And more than that, everybody can have all the rights they want together in a society that is facing uh, basically illness and potential elimination of life in this society. I'm sorry to take this strong position, but let me hear what you have to say. Mr. Siraj. Dr. Tiwari, I am in total agreement with you. And, and like I said, it is time that the decision makers, the people who are elected to serve, make decisions in the best in interest of the country. I saw a, 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 a noted commentator a couple of days ago uh, making remark to the effect that he finds it difficult to understand why legislation is not being drafted for mandatory vaccine. I am in total agreement with this. I think it's about time that the government make the hard decision in order to have the people who are vaccinated and who have taken the, 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 the risk and whatever associated with the vaccine, who have taken that time and opportunity to uh, should not be their, 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 their civic duty, their responsibilities, their, their whereabouts, should not be um, constrained by those who chose not a vaccine. I am firmly of the view, um, and frankly, um, I have no problem in being in the minority of, of, of five or ten, or, or myself and yourself, but the government need to make decisions in order to ensure that this country is properly vaccinated. All right, Vivek, uh, I mean, I know you don't share that view, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to make your case again. You see, a part of my problem is this, which is that I think that there are elements in the business community who want to have their cake and eat it too, which is to say they want the society to open up. They want the economy to open up. They want to have 100% of the customers vaccinated and unvaccinated. Yet at the same time, uh, the management of the risk of infection is not being taken into account in that process. And I feel that you have to have a balance of the two. 
Uh, if you, yes, I am all for opening up the, the economy. I don't want the economy to be closed down again. I think it's bad for everybody. It, it causes a problem. Businesses are in trouble. The employees are in trouble. People are not having, getting paid. You don't have income in the system. People don't have savings to carry them. It's very, very difficult, and businesses are under pressure. But I don't see how you should complicate the situation by having the mixing of vaccinated and unvaccinated in that way. I think it's a problem. And the second thing, this Omicron virus, there are two things that we do not know about it. One is we know that it has broken through and affected the, the vaccinated. But we know we up to now, it seems that the effects on the vaccinated are mild sim symptoms of, of infection. Okay? But we don't know, we have no information on how it affects the unvaccinated. So we don't know that. And the second thing is that it spreads so fast that if it comes into Trinidad and Tobago, chances are everybody is going to get Omicron. So the only thing we will know then, as all of us get infected, is whether it's going to affect the unvaccinated differently than the vaccinated. That's the only thing that we're going to know. And the second thing is, depending on, the, on, on how it affects vaccinated and unvaccinated, how much bed space and how much, um, um, what you call it, the, how much um, what, uh, I, ICU, how much ICU capacity we have to deal with the fallout of Omicron coming into Trinidad and hitting 1.2 million people vaccinated and unvaccinated. So that really is the prospect that we are facing. I don't know if people are putting their head in the stand and not seeing this. This is inevitable. If you, whether you close down your borders or not, that is what is going to happen. It's a matter of time. Omicron is going to come here, is going to infect everybody because it, 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 the speed of infection is fast and rapid. The only thing we don't know is whether it is going to be mild for vaccinated and not mild for the unvaccinated. And therefore, what effect that will have on the hospital system in Trinidad and Tobago. That is the decision we have to make. Yes, I agree with you. That is the decision that has to be made because when, if Omricon or when it does, like you made a, you, you said about even if we close the borders, but when the borders closed um, last year when the variant came in, and then all of a sudden, the question, and then we had a big discussion about if the borders, borders were out. closed, how borders this happened? The borders is out. Yeah, correct. It is out. But you know, the, the, other, the other side of this is people keep talking about alternatives to the vaccine. And one of the discussions that is a hot topic in Trinidad is that of ivermectin. But, and, and there's, there's calls and people are say, um, calls for ivermectin to be um, used on a broader basis and so on. But I know for a fact, and no, I am not going to name the pharmacies, but I know for a fact that ivermectin is being sold and has been, is being sold for a very long time now and is readily available at pharmacies. I have seen for myself going into the pharmacy to purchase other stuff that uh, people are coming and requesting ivermectin and buying it in large enough numbers that they are being told we can't sell you more than this. We're limiting our, our, our stock and so on and whatever. Ivermectin has already been out there. Many people are taking it. Many people continue to take it as though they're taking vitamin C. And the reality is it has not helped the situation because it has not reduced the amount of people getting into the hospital that have not taken the vaccine before. So I think Ivermectin on that basis of not being in Trinidad and Tobago or not being used widely enough, is not particularly true. I think that within our society, whether we choose to admit it or not, it is being used widely because quite simply, it is readily available. Legal or not, it is readily available across the counter if you want it. Um, I understand what you're saying about the, the safe zones and, and um, you know, unvaccinated people not being allowed to congregate. Um, you know, in, 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 in spaces and, and whatever. 
The issue with that is when we built this, the, the, the first tier of the management of COVID was essential and non-essential, and that happened all over the world globally. Um, essential and non-essential was, okay, you know what? You need food, you can get food. You need medicine, you can get medicine. In Trinidad, we expanded essential to include things like hardwares and so on, if you need to fix something in your house and, 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 and whatever. It was not expansive we enough, close up but now, we expanded okay. it. Correct, but the, the situation moving forward is, if we increase this, I agree to increase in the safe zone, but we keep, we keep looking at only 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 um, only business. What about essential services on the public service side? What about defense? What about police? What about teachers? What about customs? What about all these groups of individuals that are essential am, to our economy? That I am have very not, I am very clear on that. Anybody who works in the public service should be given a mandate to get a vaccine or be sent home without pay. I basically, administrative leave, all right? I, if you are working for the public service, which has supported you to stay home for months, sure. and some of them worked and some of them did not work, all right? We support the, the taxpayers supported you for months. You refuse to take the vaccine. Well, stay home. The taxpayer will not pay you, and you proceed with whatever business you want to proceed. I, I basically think so. I think we have to take a decision on the public service. The public service has to open for the population. Correct. And but. That is where we will end and up. The, and and the, the other thing is that we should say to the citizen, if you are not vaccinated, don't come for public service. You know, send somebody else. I mean, I'll be quite frank with you. If right, it has gotten to that position. As so I said, we are I, all going to be affected by, infected by Omicron. Anyway... I want to thank you very much for your, uh, I'm sorry this was a, such a heated discussion this morning, but maybe it's a good thing because it's a, it's a hot thing. topic. It's, it's an it important is. issue. We have to resolve it. I hope that the government will take some hard decisions after October, after December the 6th, because I know part of this is political decision making. And when you have elections, nobody wants to do anything to offend anybody. Um, but we have to take hard decisions. This is Brighter Morning with Bo and I am Bo Tiwari signing off on MCTV Multicultural TV and giving way to Andrew Cham and the 8 o'clock news.